It is said in the scriptures that God breathed into us the breath of life, and it was this that animated dust into the living beings we are today. So it stands to reason that this breath of ours, although a gift, is on par with the creator of our cosmos. That being the case, it could be reasoned that it is the variety of breathing rhythms which produce variations of consciousness, and this turns out to be exactly the case as we'll see later on. It is these different states of consciousness that are the quintessential nature of what life is by its very definition. In this video, we explore some of the variations of conscious states by consciously varying our breath as one of the greatest secrets hidden in plain sight, something which was known to the ancients but lost in the annals of history only to be rediscovered in recent modern times. The science of breath is by no means a new practice. Its roots take place in the ancient twilight of history thousands of years before Christ, somewhere in the orient of modern-day India and China. The first known records of this science is found in the ancient scriptures of the Yayurveda, which is a section in the Rig Veda of ancient India and the Tao Sing of ancient China. There are hundreds of variations of rhythmic breathing that these scriptures prescribe in order to achieve different states of consciousness and also have different health benefits such as cleansing one's blood, producing more red blood cells, and balancing the pH level throughout our entire organism, which will be examined why later on in detail. But before we get to that, let's examine some of the simple and effective breathing exercises. One important point to remember amongst all these breathing exercises is that in every case, we should always breathe with our diaphragm. One of my favorite rhythmic breathing exercises, which I've personally done for about 15 years as of the time of this recording, is from the Kundalini Upanishad, a commentary on the Yara which is dubbed Bastrika Pranayama. This particular breathing style is commenced by keeping the body, neck, and head in a vertical line, exhaling all of the current breath out to the maximum capacity of the lung, then closing the mouth and rapidly breathing in and out through the nostrils to the maximum capacity of the lungs as quickly as possible. Each inhale and exhale is considered to be one breath in this exercise. Either after 10, 20, or 30 such breaths, finish by a final large inhalation to the maximum capacity of your lungs and retain that breath as long as possible. It is generally prescribed to retain the breath in intervals of 36 seconds where anything beyond 108 seconds is considered excellent retention. After you've comfortably retained your breath for whatever maximum capacity is, Slowly exhale through your nose and control that exhalation the entire way out until you regain normal breathing again. This is one round of Bastrika Pranayama. The more you do it, the longer you'll be able to retain your breath and the more amplified various benefits will become. Try to start off by doing three rounds the first day and then add one more round each additional day for a period of about a week. So in the week, you'll be doing about 10 rounds per session. Try to continually retain your breath for longer and longer periods of time each time you retain your breath during this practice. This particular style is also called Tumo or Dumo in the Buddhistic Tantra, or is also known as the Breath of Fire. And today, more popularly, it is known as the Wim Hof Technique because it was popularized by Wim Hof several years ago. This technique was the basis for setting many of his world records for being able to voluntarily control his nervous system and psychosomatic responses to freezing temperature, among many other things. For those in which the former technique seems a little bit too abrupt, let's try something a little bit more subtle and perhaps more practical as it could be implemented any time of the day and under most circumstances. In fact, this exercise is considered to be the ideal breathing in which we perhaps should all learn for our overall optimal health. The average person inhales and exhales about every 3.3 seconds. That's about 18 breaths per minute. And decades of research has shown that this is actually considered over-breathing and in fact detrimental to our overall health in the long run. The ideal breath should be much slower, deeper, and almost always conducted through the nose. This is what this next exercise aims to teach us to do by being vigilant of our regular breathing patterns. For starters, be aware of how you normally breathe and just take note of it without trying to control or adjust it. Do this for a few seconds or a few minutes until you get a general understanding of what your regular breathing patterns are. After that, what you wanna do is always maintain a closed mouth and breathe through the nostrils unless some type of medical condition prevents you to do so. Then you wanna slowly breathe down to a pace of only about four to six breaths per minute. If six seems to be too difficult for you, try to breathe as few breaths as possible within that minute. The less breaths, the better. While doing this, you wanna make sure that the length of your inhale and exhale are about the same. The breath rhythm here should be about 50% capacity of your lungs. It's important to remember that these breaths should be slow, rhythmic, and never forced, and conducted through the diaphragm as opposed to the upper chest. There are two variations of this type of breath. The first one is never to retain your breath at any point and always have a type of continuous inhale and exhale. 
The other type of variation is that we should always retain the breath for about three to five seconds upon inhale and about three to five seconds after the exhale. Both practices are sufficient and have their own benefits. So try to do and maintain whichever one seems to be most comfortable for you to start off with. But I encourage you to try both. The key takeaway from this exercise after fine tuning which variation is appropriate to you is to try to consciously breathe like that regularly for it to become a habitual and unconscious breath style throughout the day. This type of breathing technique was held by Swami Ram as being the key to eliminating all diseases and optimal health, and it is also known by a different name today called the Buteco technique. It has been shown that when we breathe for about 5.5 times per minute for at least 10 minutes a day, our entire body gets into what's called coherence, which means more blood runs into our brains and distribute evenly through our cardiovascular system and our nervous system, which helps our body run at peak efficiency. Pulmonary researchers have dubbed this the perfect breath. The last variation of rhythmic breathing is quite possibly the most intense, and therefore provides the most rapid transformative experience among the three. Dubbed holotropic breathwork by Czech psychiatrist Stanislav Grof in the 1960s, it was a means to induce psychoactive effects of LSD naturally after the federal government banned the drug in the late 1960s. Who would have guessed that our own breath can induce the same psychoactive experience as acid? And indeed it does. Around the same time, a spiritual seeker by the name of Leonard Orr claimed to have gained similar insights into a technique, but under a different name called rebirthing breathwork during his tours of the Himalayas in the 1970s. Now this practice is a little bit more involved than the other two, so I won't demonstrate it here, but I will leave some links in the description below for you to get a feel of what this practice entails. The general practice goes a little something like this. The practitioner lays down on their back and relaxes their entire body. They can use a small pillow to prop up their head if it feels necessary. You want to be in a relaxed and comfortable position because this breath exercise lasts anywhere from 10 minutes to 3 hours. We start off by closing the eyes and begin deep rhythmic breathing generally through the nose. Mouth breathing is permissible for this exercise, but you generally want to conduct this exercise through the nose. You continuously breathe in this pattern for about 50-90% to 90 of your lung capacity without any kind of break or interruption for as long as you possibly can. And this is generally about 60 minutes to 90 minutes for the average person. The important point in this exercise is to not stop the rhythmic breathing until you have concluded the session. Experiences that many have had, including myself, range from a blissful withdrawal of reality, alternate realities altogether, reliving memories of past events long forgotten, bodily invigoration which is hard to compare to anything else, and therapeutic releases of various types of trauma and much, much more. This particular practice is generally better done under the supervision of a facilitator, at least for the first few times that you attempt it, so that you have a general understanding of how you are likely to react when doing this type of breath exercise. I encourage you to try all the above exercises at some point if all this is new to you. For those of you watching this video who have tried any of the above mentioned techniques, share your experience in the comment section below. And now for the science part of the breath exercises for either the naysayers or anybody else who wants to know the why behind all these breath exercises. For starters, when you retain your breath, as we did in the first exercise, it forces carbon dioxide buildup in our bodies, which causes oxygen saturation in the blood cells to decrease and forces our body to increase the production of red blood cells to offset the ones that were dropped during retention. This increases the red blood cells and thereby inadvertently the oxygen within our new blood cells and is one of the reasons we feel immediately invigorated shortly after doing these types of breathwork exercises. The second reason for the feel-good sensation is when we breathe through our nose, particularly with intensity as we did in the first and third exercise, our nasal cavity releases nitric oxide into our blood, which stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system and slows down the heart, helps dilate the blood vessels, and relaxes the entire body by doing so. To a lesser extent, it also helps drain the lymphatic system, which is extraordinarily important in regulating our body's immune system. Studies have shown that after a series of breath retention practices, our spleen actually contracts during these breath retentions, and the longer we hold our breath, the more hemocratic and hemoglobin concentrations in our blood occur, something to the tune of six to three percent respectively. Now this is important because if these levels get too low, we are susceptible to anemia, low blood oxygen levels, which can cause fatigue, brain fog, and a whole host of other perilous diseases. Another noteworthy benefit to these types of exercises is that when lactic acid builds up in our muscles, they can help rapidly drain it, and expedite muscle recovery. This is particularly useful for athletes, and it is something that elite athletes have practiced under the name of high altitude training for decades, where they intentionally temporarily restrict their oxygen while exercising. This technique is actually shown to double an athlete's endurance in practically every sport. Lastly, every human being on the planet has something called a nasal cycle, which corresponds to the oscillation between one nostril opening while the other one is closed. 
Intriguingly, it has been shown to closely correlate to our emotional and mental states, something which science has been aware of for a long time but doesn't completely understand. An interesting component to nasal cycle theory is that the faster the oscillation between the two nostrils happen, the more likely our body seems to be under some type of distress or illness or disease. Correlations between nasal cycles is such that when the left nose is open and the right is closed, this seems to activate the parasympathetic nervous system within our body. And inversely, when the right nostril is open and the left is closed, this seems to activate the sympathetic nervous system within our body. Now, I did a full video on the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve, which I'll link in the description below, and I encourage you to watch that. Again, science doesn't really understand why nasal cycles are associated with the different parts of our autotomic nervous system. But it is worthy to point out that the lungs are covered with nerve bundles extending all over both sides of the lungs. Many of the nerves associated with the parasympathetic nervous system are located on the lower lobe of the lungs, which is why slow, deep, and diaphragmic breathing has been associated with relaxation and calmness. It literally activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Now this subject of breath is a broad and vast one, and it's something that I've personally been interested in for almost two decades. So I can't really cover all of the topics in this short video, but I will reference most of the books and research material in the description below so that you can check it out for yourself. So I wanna leave you guys with some fun facts about breath discovered by pulmonary research over many years. The first one is that oxygen produces 16 times more energy than carbon dioxide, which is the buildup or byproduct of oxygen we breathe when we exhale. Strangely, however, it has been shown that through meticulous research that a greater level of carbon dioxide within our system is associated with less illness and disease, meaning that people who have less carbon dioxide in their system are far more susceptible to anxiety and panic attack. Albert St. Gregory, a biochemist who won the Nobel Peace Prize for isolating vitamin C, spent many years trying to understand the fundamental nature of life as a biochemical process and how it correlates to respiration. His theory was an interesting one, which attempted to solve the 5,000 year riddle of what Eastern philosophy called prana or chi. St. Gregory's theory postulated that everything was more or less alive, but the more animated an organism was, was only due to its ability to transfer electrons between itself because an abundance of electrons is what gives things more or less life, as he called it, or animation. This electron exchange gives things its dynamics of animation, and is not surprisingly best facilitated by oxygen, since that has the most electron-giving receptivity of all the elements. And, not surprisingly, this is what we breathe to live. When anthropologists from the University of Buffalo were researching the lifespan of certain tribes, they discovered the lifespan was not associated with diet and environment as much as it was with lung capacity. This means to say that the larger your lung capacity is, the longer and better quality of life one generally had. As one researcher from the university puts it, our capacity to breathe full breaths measures both the quality and longevity of our living capacity. Breathing through our mouth most of our life changes our facial and physical appearance particularly the mouth, jaw, and the airways within our throat and the lungs forcing us to breathe heavier and heavier throughout our mouth over time. And pulmonary research has found out that this is associated with numerous respiratory and non-respiratory diseases. If you enjoyed this video or you found any value in it, please make sure to comment, share, and subscribe to the channel.